Welcome back, or welcome for your, if it's your first Streaming Media Connect session of the day or of the week. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the editor and VP of Streaming Media and the conference chair for Streaming Media Connect. Thanks for taking some time to spend with us today. Over the rest of this week and into next, we've got almost two full weeks of presentations, panels, and in-depth workshops, and I hope to see you at as many of them as possible. This week, it's all panels and presentations on everything from technical topics like encoding and ATSC 3.0 to business and strategy focused topics like advertising, live streaming, sports streaming, and we'll end things with a future looking panel predicting what OTT will look like in five years. And next week, we have in-depth workshops from streaming media contributing editors, as well as from some of the leading technology companies in our space. Before we get into today's presentation, I'd like to thank our uh, platinum sponsor, or I should say our diamond sponsor, Limelight Networks, who is sponsoring this entire week of Streaming Media Connect, as well as Matrox and EEG Enterprises, who are sponsoring this session. And with that, we've got a few messages from each of them. At EEG Video, we make closed captioning simple. With Falcon, one of EEG's captioning solutions, you can easily and affordably produce captioned live streams for engaged audiences while maintaining compliance and accessibility. Hosted on EEG Cloud, Falcon embeds captions directly into your live streams to all major streaming platforms. Using a human captioner or Lexi, EEG's automatic captioning service, Falcon is easy to set up and manage from anywhere delivering an affordable solution for event producers and content creators to reach more viewers with accessible content. This virtual encoder makes captioning your streaming media simpler than ever. From education to government to broadcasts, Falcon is the solution for full control over captioning your content. Discover our range of closed captioning solutions for all live video workflows. Visit eegent.com today. EEG Video. Captioning Innovation. Thanks again to Matrox and EEG for sponsoring this session, which is all about remote production. And the move to remote production was well underway a year or so ago when it sped up dramatically, along with everything else in the online video industry. It suddenly became just about the only game in town. And streaming media producer, contributing editor Anthony Barocas has written dozens of articles about various remote production related topics. And he's going to spend the next hour taking your questions. And if there aren't any questions, he's just going to riff, man. Uh, but if you do have questions, put them in the Q&A tab, please. And uh, he will get them there. Anthony, how are you doing? If I take myself off of mute, I think I'm doing good. Excellent. Excellent. Good to see you. <laughs> you're down in Frisco, Texas, where uh, the weather's not exactly too friendly, but you're, you're here. Yes. Uh, thankfully, it's, it's been kind of crazy. Um, there's uh, a lot of areas that don't have power because Texas was not prepared. Uh, you know, uh, the wind, the wind turbines all got frost on them and they had to be de-iced and other things happened. You know, we don't all know the extent of it, but there's been uh, rolling blackouts down here, people without power. Uh, it's been down to single digits and Texas homes are not made for single digit weather. Right. Um, so uh, a lot of people have been uh, trying to jump around. So if you all lose me, I apologize. It's out of my hands. Um, I'll just put that out there. <laughs> all right. Uh, we have been warned. Uh, hopefully it won't happen. And uh, with that, I will let you take it away from here. 
All right. So first and foremost, there's a chat bar on the side. I have the chat bar on my screen. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I see there's 101 people in here, minus me and Eric and Steve. There's less than 100. Uh, but if you have questions, put them in the chat bar. Ask away. I have that right here so I can keep an eye on things. But I do have a whole bunch of tips. Uh, when I did uh, my social media this morning, I said more than 50. It's well over 50 now because I kept adding to it and everything and writing and writing and writing. Um, so I had hoped to like make it into this wonderful slide presentation, but I didn't get a chance to do that. But I'm starting off. The spotlight behind your bed is bright when you move away from it. Exactly. How many times do you do remote? Um, conferences where the person's you're looking up their nose, there's a bright light behind you, the camera's overexposed, and it's the wrong color. It's just awful. Um, well, I'm going to tell you how to fix all that. And um, yes, I did that for effect because everyone who's done remote work knows the agony of, yeah, I don't know how to fix it. So <laughs> that's what I'm. That's what I'm here to help people do. I have a whole slew of things. Um, but basically, it's you're here, they're there, and the audience is everywhere else. And that's what we've got to do. Uh, first, I want to put a few, a few disclosures. I'm going to mention uh, a bunch of manufacturers, software packages uh, in these tips because I want to help people with streaming. No manufacturer has any connection with my talk today other than the people who have sponsored the beginning. I have not been paid or otherwise compensated to mention any particular product or solution. Anything I mention is my own finding. Um, and if I use it, I, I own it because I have it and I purchased it with my own money. I'll try to be clear about what I have direct experience with versus what I know about but haven't actually used yet. Uh, but I might want to mention it because it's a solution that's out there that may be of use to someone else as opposed to something that I've just limited to what I have hands on with. Um, in addition to the articles on streaming media producer, I also have the Aiba Tech Thoughts channel on YouTube, which you can find um, at Aiba.com, I-E-B-A-C. Oh, it kind of looks like that, except without the dash. Um, I have a studio space in Frisco, Texas uh, called Frisco Studios, and I founded Stream for Us, which is solely dedicated to streaming services and production. I founded that a year ago, well before COVID hit, and little did I know how big streaming services would become in 2020, actually two years ago. Um, everyone became remote. Uh, every meeting is remote. Uh, the occasional Skype or WebEx became a full day of remote meetings for the vast majority of companies around the world. Oh, thank you for that. Um, that said, companies realized that they still need a way to elevate some of their uh, events beyond the typical WebEx or Zoom link to give the audience a more interesting experience. So, you know, we could do everybody's on WebEx, blah, 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 or, or we could do something that looks different and looks like a show. And that's what we're trying to do as video producers. And um, that's really what I'm here to talk about today. Now, that said, um, we want to give the audience a more interesting viewing experience. And we're trying to differentiate what we're doing uh, for like yearly leadership meetings or summits versus the same WebEx that everybody else is doing, even if we're feeding what we're doing into Zoom or WebEx, which is exactly what I'm doing now. I mean, I'm, I'm using my production and I'm using a DSLR and a lavalier microphone, and I'm feeding it into Zoom, which is what we're using for the distribution platform. So the same can be said for uh, business meetings. So let's talk remote cameras, because when your guest is remote, the camera is remote too. So obviously for remote cameras, we have the built-in webcams and laptops and some desktop computers and all-in-ones. And generally, these aren't very good. We all know how bad they look. The resolution is like 720p, if that. And the, ca uh, the camera itself is not great. And it's easily washed out if you've got lighting behind you, like we saw. Um, or if there's a window to the side, or you know, God forbid, somebody puts all the windows behind them. You, you really have no hope unless you want to have a shadow as a guest. Honestly, the selfie cameras on a cell phone or a tablet are a distinct step up. Give it a quick rating of different systems, Wirecast, vMix, OBS, and the like. They're all awesome. I'm going to answer that. For, yeah, I get that later. I'll answer that quick. I don't use them all 
I, dar I try to be proficient with one and that's hard enough. So uh, my tool of choice is a Wirecast because of the eight built-in remotes in the app. Um, I'm not knocking the other tools. The other tools are good tools. I have not, I don't have the experience with them to give you an expert comparison between all three because I'm not a master of all three and able to say, oh, this is better and that's better and this better and that better. So I'm just going to put that out there. Um, now, uh, a selfie camera in a cell phone or a tablet is a distinct step up. So if you're looking at someone's uh, laptop webcam and it's looking awful and it's got fingerprints on it or you know whatever, ask your remote guest, you know, hey, do you have an iPad or a, a tablet of any kind, a Surface uh, or a Samsung tablet? Try to, let's try to connect with that, see how it looks. And they can literally place it on the screen of their laptop and act as a laptop, but the camera will be better. And they can plug in earbuds right into the tablet and be good to go with both microphone and being able to hear. Um, now, external USB webcams, other than this one, which I distinct, I del deliberately made look bad. Um, external USB webcams offer a distinct step up over most every computer's internal webcam. Um, so if your guest has an external webcam anywhere in the house or anywhere in the office, have them use it because it is a definite step up if you want them to look, have a better image quality for the delivery. And the microphones in those things work better too. I say this with the intent that um, you actually get a decent webcam. So I'm partial to Logitech. I have three of them. And like I says, I've purchased them with my own money. I use them. There are other ones out there. I am not an expert in every webcam. Um, I have tested a few. And I know that if you're going to spend $15 on Amazon for a 4K webcam, it's not going to be that good. If Logitech is charging $200 for the Brio, there's a reason why a good webcam costs more money. So when I say get a good webcam, I mean at least 50 bucks, you know, 50 to hundred dollars, you know, around a hundred dollars can get you a, a really good webcam that will deliver a superior picture. You can even change the focus on it, things like that. So I'll just put that out there. Um, how about audio recording mics? Is it better to use external mics or inbuilt with cams, mono versus stereo? Mm, good question. I'll get to that in the audio section. <laughs> now, now the challenge, if you're going to use an external webcam and they don't have it, it the challenge is to get, the, get it to the client. Now, you can find uh, a webcam if you can find one online because, man, they, it, they're, hard to, they're, they're hard to source at this point. If you can find them, get one, get a couple, have them, uh, and then use like a bubble mailer and send it out to your client and include a um, return receipt in there. So when they're done, they stuff it back in the bag, put a new label on top and send it back to you. This way, you're not without it for a long time. Unless, you know, um, you want to, you have a client you want to impress or something like that, what you could do is, you know, you order it online and ship it, drop ship it directly to the client. So you're not paying for any shipping. And then they get the webcam and then they're like, well, what do I do with it? And you're like, you know what? Keep it. You know, I loved working with you. Look forward to working with you again. Keep it. Because if you're paying 50 bucks, 75 bucks, but you've really impressed this person with your skills and your expertise. When they think of, hey, I've got this thing coming up and I need somebody to make me look good, they'll think of you. So just putting that out there. It's not necessarily a streaming tip, but it's a business tip. Um, stepping up from webcams, there's DSLRs. And there's a lot of DSLRs out there. And not a lot of them are being used right now. So there's a lot of solutions that almost every single uh, camera manufacturer has put together. I do have, I started putting together some slides. Here we go. Okay. So like Canon has this EOS webcam utility so that you can connect your DSLR directly to the um, computer itself. And it will appear as a webcam to your software of choice. Um, Panasonic has it, Fuji has it, Sony has it, go away, go away. <laughs> so, you know, these solutions are out there to, if, if, if your customer, hey, yeah, I've, I've got a couple Sony cameras. Hey, okay, download this software, put your camera on the tripod, put it, put it right over top of your monitor, like I'm doing right now. This that you're looking at right now, this is, let me, 
Where's my cursor? There it is. This is a, a Panasonic. This is an old GH4, but at this point, you know, GH4, GH3, they're, you know, they're both full HD cameras. I'm getting full HD off of it into my mixer. And this is what gives me the, the depth. This is what gives me the evenness of tone and the clarity over a webcam. Two, two, two. Any more questions after the mics? Nope. Okay. Um, once you get your camera, whatever it is set up, the next thing um, to quote a, any real estate agent is location, location, location. First of all, don't have something bright behind the person. Like we were, you know, if anybody came in late, I will go back to my USB webcam. And you don't have something bright behind you when you're talking. You know, it's like, oh yeah, well, I've just got my uh, laptop here, and it 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 the light going into the camera directly, whether it be a window or even side light on some of those things, is just going to wash out the image, and you're not going to get a, a good, clean picture like you want. So location is a key thing when you are talking about um, having a good setting. I mean, you don't want to have uh, a room with a lot of clutter. You want to make sure that um, if they if they have a background of stuff that it's interesting and relevant, like in an office, it may be filled with stacks of paper, a printer, and things like that. Ask them if it's okay. If can we just put this on the floor for tomorrow? You know, and then put like one of your awards or something up there. So your your goal is to make them look good. You know, you're the producer. Um, you want to make sure that not just them, but the setting they're in looks good and properly reflects what's going on. So picking a good uh, location and then even like, like I have here, I've elevated the camera. It's not down low looking at me because nobody wants to look uh, up the nose of the person who's talking the whole time. Yeah, hey, I've got this great stuff to tell you. It's really awesome, but it's not a very flattering view. Um, being able to have it at eye level, and we've been doing this a lot <laughs> since then. And, you know, it's like a, it's a running joke. And I asked them, do you happen to have any Amazon boxes? Maybe. <laughs> Most often, they might have one. And you put it up on a box. You put it up on the second box, you know, and then you put the laptop up there. And then it's even with their eyes. And then they're talking to you like this. And it just has a much more... It's a better view for the audience when you can allow the person to relate to the audience more directly as opposed to I'm just sitting at my desk and, you know, with a laptop. And I want you, you want to make it look like they really care and they're really motivated to be here because they're, we're being brought in to make an event look better. And that's that's our goal. Kind of getting off the script here. No, 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 no. Um, I have if there's time. Um, I'd like to work with my guests and I have them do a tech check. You know, they can use their cell phone. Um, they can walk around, you know, their office. Oh, I've got this and this and this. And, you know, you use the selfie view, look around and say, oh, right here, this looks good. You've got light coming in from the window and everything. This looks great. Okay. Can we do something there? Or if they've got a desk, you can see what the desk looks like. You can hear what things sound like and see if there's any uh, potential noise issues as well. But I'd like to do a tech check several days ahead, have them walk around the house or office and pick the best looking spot. Um, maybe you have to ask them to adjust the blinds, Lo you know, lower, lower the blinds, pull the drapes, rotate a table, declutter the shelves behind them. Um, almost all the time when you tell them, you know, that, oh, yeah, we just want to, you know, make this shot look really good for you. They're actually open to like working with you. And, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, you, you move this. This will make it look better. I, I've never once had anybody tell me, no, I want to keep this clutter of paper behind me. You know, they understand you're trying to make them look good. And, you know, any advice you can give them and any help you can give them um, really does pay off in making your shot look better. And it actually makes them feel better about being on camera too, because they're confident that you've helped them, that they're putting forth a good image. Uh, let's see. Um, they use a Canon, a Crestron Flex to join a Microsoft team meeting, which they use to pull out two separate HDMI feeds, people in content of Blackmagic, like they pulled them to OBS before only to... Uh, yes, um, Microsoft Teams actually exports uh, NDI as well. Uh, that's Eric. Uh, 
Teams exports NDI. There's some caveats with it, depending upon the power of your machine and how many people you're trying to pull, but you can actually get a separate feed, separate NDI feed uh, if you um, have NDI integration in your level of teams. And that's a really uh, great feature as well. A uh, question from question actually, your green screen mix is much crisper than I have seen normally. Very little blending on your edges. How did you pull that off? Perhaps this is uh, Wirecast handling better than Zoom. Um, so Steve is what? Uh, Steve, made, oh, Steve uh, related, related. Um, the green screen makes as much crisper. Thanks. <laughs> Except it's not green screen. So um, this is all actual. There's no trickery or anything like that here. Um, I don't even have a green screen. It's, I have a gray screen. So that's why this looks as crisp as it looks is because um, it's real. So if you've ever seen my tech videos on the IEBOCOM YouTube channel, you've seen much of this stuff before. So go watch some of those. Uh, although this is a new set, it wasn't a different part of the house before. Uh, continuing on, answer, answer those two questions. Do, 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 do. Uh, so yeah, work with your remote guest. Let them know you're trying to help them. You know, elevate the camera, get a good camera, get a good location, get some good lighting in front of them, whether it be a desk lamp or, you know, anything they can put in front of them. As long as you don't have bright light behind them, generally, if, if there's nothing bright behind them, there's going to be something bright in front of them, whether it be a room light, a table lamp, or something else that they could do, and that will make them be lit. I have a production light, obviously, but um, we're not asking our guests to do that, but hey, if you want to, and you're going to send them stuff, you could send them a ring light. You could send them a, a flat panel for 50 bucks, and that will give them a nice light in front of their face. The next really important thing is audio. Remote audio is next. And perhaps it's even more important than video for doing a remote, which is odd to say that. But having just done a whole series of things earlier this week, 10 people in one um, big production. The two that were the most annoying were the two that had bad audio, because you will find that if you can hear someone clearly and it has good sound, you can overlook some drop frames or stuck video. But if the video is clear, but the audio has all sort of glitches or is distorted or it, it uh, uh, has issues, it doesn't work. It literally doesn't work. So audio, even though we don't think of it as much, is so important to a good remote stream. I'm using a lavalier mic. The lavalier goes into the camera, camera comes into the computer, and it comes over here. So that's how that's working uh, for me. Um, if you have guests and they have, I actually have a prop here, and they have a USB headset. So they can just plug the USB in and then select that in whatever connection method you're using, and they have a boom mic, these produce great audio because the microphone is right here. It reduces the, the volume of everything else compared to the voice dramatically and produces better audio. I'm using a lavalier. There are lavaliers that will plug directly into an iPad, or um, I think there are some USB that can go directly into computer, and then you can select it as your audio source. That would be great. Or if you've got a headset, like I've got uh, earbuds in so I can hear everyone. If you've got earbuds, sometimes they have a mic, but I find that the headsets with the mic, the microphone is really made for phone quality. So it's not a full bodied, it's not a good sound versus a headset mic. It really sounds like, oh, I'm talking on a phone. So it's a catch 22. Um, USB headset. And remember how we said most bit computer cameras are not awesome? The same kind of goes for the microphones. The built-in microphones, even they might say it has an array of microphones. It's, it's an array of really inexpensive microphones. Um, they're still going to pick up the whole room, the echo, the reverb, and it makes it harder to hear the voice of the person versus everything else. And it's made worse when they won't wear earbuds and 
they are using the built-in speakers because then the microphone is hearing the audio from the speakers and it goes back in and it has to do a whole bunch of processing to try and cancel that out. And sometimes it takes out part of the person's voice as well. So having them wear earbuds, earphones, headphones, anything, even if you're just going to use the built-in audio, but having them wear headphones is so important to getting good audio. If you're going to do a debate with multiple people talking and you've got multiple voices going and somebody's trying to say something, it's going to chop up their audio. It's going to cancel part of what they're saying if, the, if they have an open speaker as what they're trying to hear. That's just the way it is. Um, yes, this will be... I don't have a presentation. I started on one. There was just too much content. So I just wrote it out. It'll be in an article. I have the text here. Um, what are your feelings on Azure, Google Cloud, IBM for remote cloud production systems? Do you find one offers more availability of GPU instances or available zones that provide advantages to certain clients? Yes. <laughs> Again, I am not an expert in all things. I'm, I'm just trying to offer tips and answer questions. That question is a bit above my head because I have not spent considerable time using AWS in multiple instances, multiple zones, and Azure in multiple instances and multiple zones, and Google Cloud in multiple instances and multiple zones, and IBM Cloud in multiple, in to be able to actually offer a comparison. And I just don't have that experience. So I'm sorry, that one is above my pay grade. Um, how do you bring in guest 1080p? I find many solutions in the 720p room, but challenge to find the higher bit rate. It's not so much about bit rate. It's about, um, if you, what, um, software, what, uh, standard is being used, uh, web RTC sort of defaults to 720p. Although there have been people who say that they can use Chrome and an external webcam, and it will actually send 1080p to vMix. Although I tried it and it didn't work. So not entirely reliable. Um, I'm probably feeding Zoom a full 1080 because of the camera into vMix into Zoom, but Zoom is gonna dump it down anyway. So in as much as you can try to get it up, uh, a lot of the software is gonna dump it back down. Um, how are your clients ooh, handling caption workflows, especially simulated live events? For simulated live, we have it captioned and then it becomes part of the video. Um, for live live events, there are services online where you can send the RMTP to the captioning service and then you take their RMTP and you send it to your destination. Yes, they're not 100% accurate. That's just because it, that's the nature of the business. You know, you're either gonna pay a whole lot of money for someone, for a physical person to capture in it and they'll get to like 99%, but you're gonna have more of a delay because they have to like cognitively hear it and and do it. Uh, if you do computer captions, you do 95, 97%, and, but, but the turn's faster. Um, obviously, EEG is sponsoring a love Falcon cap, but I'm looking for playback. Um, I don't do captioning. That would be more of a producer end. So I'm just more talking about remote clients coming into systems. So let me get back on that. Uh, if there's someone else in uh, the chat who can answer the uh, captioning thing, feel free to jump in there and have a Discord. I'm going to move this down because the comments are coming in. Um, but ba boom. So talking about earbuds, even basic earbuds work great. Like these, you don't really notice them. It doesn't look like I have a headset or wires on, but yet I have an earbud in both ears and I have it draped behind my back. So this way, we use these a lot. We have mobile kits that we've built for uh, one, one client I work with a lot. And um, th having this, even on an extender cable, a little headphone extender, they can stand back, they can move, they can gesture and you know, really express themselves without it looking like you know, you've wired them up into a machine. Uh, and this makes sure that the speaker only hears what the person's presenting. How am I doing on time? 31, I should go faster. Uh, Bluetooth headsets work too. Uh, earbuds or over the, uh, they work. Um, sometimes you got to work with the person to get them paired, especially if they're paired to their phone, you have to unpair them from the phone to get them to pair to the computer. So that can be a kind of technical issue that you have to work through. And they add just a slight bit more delay in addition to the delay that you're getting over the web. And that can throw some people off if they're really used to like face-to-face -face communications. If you can add a lavalier mic, like the one I'm wearing, it can really help the audio. Like I says, there are some models that can plug directly into computers. And 
Getting away from the technical aspect, the, re the remote guest's location has a huge effect on sound as well. Um, some pe people love tile these days. Tile and wood floors are all the rage. But then when they sit in, a, in their office, it sounds like they're sitting in a big box, which is essentially what they are sitting in. So asking them to see if they have carpet they can put down or move over, uh, or if perhaps pick another room that has carpet, uh, maybe um, a rec room or something like that, a playroom, and that carpet or um, fabric furniture really makes a huge difference in, in deadening the sound of a room and making it not sound like they're in a box. Um, I mean, I had one client, just want to relate this story. I had one client who we did a series of shows and it looked and sounded great, but you would never know that she was standing and her laptop was on a couple things on an ironing board in her bedroom but the bedroom was quiet. She could close the door. It was isolated. It was quiet. And she had a nice pattern wall behind her and a painting. And it just really made her and the environment look and sound really good. And it's just picking a location. You know, we didn't really have to do much else. Earbuds and the built-in laptop microphone, but the location really helped make sure the sound was clear, less not a lot of noise or distractions. Uh, let's see, remote connections. Now, most of the time, your remote guests will not be tech savvy. So having a tech check day to walk through things is really important. The way they connect is also important. Like I use vMix and it has a very easy to use web interface for remote connections. I'd even say it's easier than some um, web applications that keep asking you to like confirm your camera and everything settings. Um, but vMix is not alone in using web RTC. You know, there's OBS and many other apps that do it as well. The downside of this sort of connection is that it's designed to be a single point to point connection between their camera and my system. It's not designed to be a business chat solution where, oh, let me share my slides. Uh, WebRTC is not designed for that. It's a point to point. So you have to like, you know, checks and balances if this like, oh, I need to do slides. Okay, well, give me the slides and then, you know, we'll work out a solution for that. And I actually didn't get into this script, um, but that's actually worth mentioning as well. I had a guest shoot against the closet. Anything that works. <laughs> Put this in UNA too. Do you have any experience with uh, IPACAM Pro? It makes your cell phone a webcam on your computer for Zoom, et cetera. Video seem good. Yes, there's a several uh, apps that you can put on your cell phones that will have them show up as uh, devices into your laptop. Those work great. And the added benefit is if you can get a cheap stand off of Amazon or wherever, I'm not partial to Amazon, they didn't pay me, um, that will, you know, they can have their laptop down here, but then put the other camera up in front of them so that, you know, it's easier than lifting a whole laptop. But this way they can look at that and talk to their camera when they want to talk. And then while they're participating or as a guest is or anything, they can look back down here at the laptop in, in the Zoom. So like I have a Zoom over here, but my camera's up here. So I look down and I look up. It's the way, the way things are these days. Um, design a, okay. You can also use free software like NDI screen capture to grab the screen of Zoom or WebEx and bring it into your video production software of choice. Like, so some apps like Teams, like we mentioned before, all even offer multiple NDI outs directly from the apps. So you can have people come into your show via Zoom or Teams. You grab that screen and you bring it into your production app so that you can do with it what you want. You could do like a cool picture in picture that I'm not really using very much, but I built for the show. And that way, they might be using what's familiar to them, and you're not forcing them to go through a technological hurdle, but at the same time, you're still able to bring it in and do what you need to do in your app of choice. Um, what combination systems are you using? Sounds like vMix call, feelings and Sienna, LTN, media looks versus Zoom teams into a switching workflow. Again, I'm not an expert on call and Sienna and LTN and media looks versus Zoom and Teams into a switching workflow. So that's seven different things. I'm not an expert in all six. That's not, I'm not an expert on all those things to be able to accurately give you an answer on which one's best. Um, like I said, I found something that worked and there's enough people who are asking for this that I've spent most of my time building shows, tech checking and doing shows and admittedly, not as much time as I would like exploring other solutions to, you know, jack of all trades, master of none type of thing. But it's always important to be aware of other solutions that are out there because they may offer um, 
of speed and efficiency or quality that you don't currently have, but you wouldn't know about it unless you tried it. So it's, it's a tough thing that, you know, you, want to, you need to work, but at the same time, you need to explore and learn and try out things as well. And I don't have a whole lot of that time right now because I'm doing a lot of time working. Um, how do you hand, handle internet in remote locations? Um, that is always a tough one. I did not really cover that in here, but um, there's bonding. Sorry, got a phone call coming in. Uh, bonded sources. I'm actually using bonding right now because as we said, I'm in Texas and the winter conditions could have the power or my internet get a little wonky. So I'm using a bonded connection. I have uh, one of my connections is my LTE modem right here, which is connected and um, one of the two ethernet sources into my uh, desktop, which is then splitting the signal across them. And it's working for uh, my connection into Zoom. Um, if you look on my Aibacom tech check, tech, Aiba Tech Thoughts channel, um, I've done events in remote locations and I've used the Netgear and we've done it over cellular and LTE. And it is, um, it's something you have to actually do your own tech check. You have to go to that site if possible and see what's available because maybe Verizon is there, but at and is not. Or maybe you need additional height and you got to get your, your modem higher up above the trees to you know, see a good signal or you need directional antennas. So those things need to be explored. And other solutions like um, Starlink, the, the new Wi-Fi that from the cloud, um, that could be satellite internet. That could be a great solution for rural areas because you just need to be able to point straight up. That's, that's um, a great thing. What do I use for bonding? Right now I'm using Speedify on the uh, PC and again, not, they're not sponsoring. I actually pay for it. So that's what I use. Uh, when you're moving video back and forth between the apps, you also need to move audio back and forth between the apps. And it's actually harder than you might think because every computer is designed to play out the audio to your headphones, not to send it to a different app and not send it to your headphones. So uh, what I use in these systems is on a PC, there's a software called Virtual Audio Cables, which is a great name because that's exactly what they are. It's like, plug this into vMix and plug this into Zoom and that cable goes across and in Zoom, you say, look at the Virtual Audio Cable and hey, there's the audio from vMix and it just works. Um, they also have a Mac version and on, and on, um, there's also audio hijack from Rogue Amoeba software that allows you to hijack the audio from an app instead of just sending it out. You can reroute it as you see fit. So there's a, there's a lot of um, solutions out there to managing your audio within the computer because you know we're not using a TriCaster. A TriCaster is a single um, purpose tool. And if you wanted to have like uh, Zoom, you'd have Zoom on another computer and you would physically route audio and video cables between it. What we're doing, or what many people do, is you run multiple apps on one computer. So you're kind of doing it within the computer, kind of behind the scenes kind of thing. And that's why they're virtual. So it, managing it is a little, little trickier. And sometimes, speaking of remotes, sometimes you need to help a remote guest. Um, and it's hard to explain how to fix the web browser where they turned off permissions for the webcam, but now you need it on. Um, for remote control, there's tools like AnyDesk, TeamViewer, Parsec, uh, Google Remote Desktop for Windows. Oh yeah, Google Remote Desktop and Windows even has its own remote desktop capability. So there's lots of different uh, tools out there. Um, we at uh, the One Studio, we settled on AnyDesk. We tried Parsec, we had some issues with it uh, in terms of getting it configured. And we jumped over to uh, AnyDesk and we've had good success with that. Uh, the downside with these remote tools is um, when you are remoted in to help them set up their PC or whatever, you're also using CPU cycles and it's also compressing that screen and sending it back to you. So if you want clean video, you actually have to hang up the connection for their video to come through clean. I mean, we've, we've, we've done that where when I'm logged in, I'd be getting five frames a second and the instant I terminate the connection, boom, I get my full 30 frames a second. So these things are 
they do use a bit of processing power, both to handle what you're doing and translate and to compress the entire screen and send it out to you. So those are great tools, but just be wary that there's a caveat that you can't be like, oh, I'm just going to stay logged in while they're doing the remote. Don't do that. Um, and this brings up a good point. Uh, you can rely on what the end user has available, or you could build your own kits. There's lots of hardware out there. Uh, we saw one of the sponsors, Matrox, has that nice piece of hardware where you can plug in four cameras and, whoosh, and send it right to your studio. Great if you need to do what they call Remy, you know, just have four cameras out there. And those cameras are going to come into you, and then you're going to use a different path for communication, crew communication. You just have four camera operators at a show, but you're doing the production remotely. That's a kind of different than what I'm talking about here, but those tools are available as hardware tools where they can use SRT and higher quality um, connectivity so that the signal that you get is more robust, uh, more resistant to internet issues and dropouts and everything, but they have more latency. So if you're doing a business thing where people need to talk to each other, you need to bring the latency down or you get that constant, uh, but uh, uh, the issue where people are talking on top of each other and then they stop and and everything. So there's there's benefits. There's, there's always a trade off. You know, it's like better image quality, longer. That comes at the cost of longer latency to make sure all the packets get there. Um, apps. Uh, what do all these remote things connect to? I'm using vMix, but there's also Wirecast, OBS, Livestream Studio, Boink's Mimo Live. Uh, there's a couple others. I have, I have smaller apps that I've touched on a little bit. Uh, and don't forget the venerable TriCaster as a destination because it can definitely receive NDI and it can definitely receive SRT and it can do a show and push a stream. So even though you think of it as a piece of hardware, it's definitely a production tool that's available for re receiving remote guests. Um, and then also the TriCaster has the uh, tie-in with Skype. You know, you have a separate controlling thing, but you can have multiple Skype connections come into the TriCaster. And like we said before, if you have uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams, Microsoft owns Skype, uh, Teams can also output separate NDIs for separate guests. Although there are limits to that. If you have 50 guests, don't expect 50 NDIs. And then as you add all these NDI feeds, be aware each one takes a pretty sizable chunk of data on your network. So, you know, if you've got 10 NDI feeds, you're going to need more than a gigabit network to handle everything. Uh, let me do a quick uh, question. Do you have a matrix of the categories of product needed for the best vendors to consider? No, I don't. What do you use for bonding? Uh, TriCaster 2 Elite Live Call Connect supports compositing nine separate Zoom feeds in the one Zoom meeting teams or Discord. Uh, yes, the, the, the new one, I think it's $15,000. Um, will take a Zoom, chop it up, and then give you separate uh, feeds, which is actually um, a really nice feature because people really have gravitated towards Zoom. So having that Zoom hook is like a really nice feature. If you have one of those TriCaster 2 Elites, and um, that's in a different price class than I think many businesses are, are going to be using. Restroom is as well a good option, offering a 10 remote colors and comfortable composition all within the browser. Restream, a restream. Yes, I'm getting to those. <laughs> so those are all things. Um, however, the downside with all of these tools that I just mentioned is they sit on the computer in front of you. Actually, it's right over here. And as we all know from like the weather here in Texas, if I need to have a bunch of feeds come into me, but my internet is being hammered and I have no control over it, or there's we're in an ice storm and they're doing roller blackouts. And part of the blackout is the, the next block over where the cable company has their little thing on the telephone pole and poof, that goes down. I get no internet. My internet goes off for an hour and it could be in the middle of a show. So that's the problem having it come down to me. All of those feeds come down to me. And if I have seven you know, feeds coming down to me, that's an issue. So the opposite of that is to use production in the cloud where you take all those feeds and they're all coming to a place that's not here. They're coming to a place in the cloud where there's plenty of bandwidth, you know, some data server somewhere that's not having rolling blackouts or they have a generator. And <clears throat> There's lots of things. For instance, StreamYard can handle 10 people on screen, but if you're going to produce it, then you're taking one of those slots, so there's nine people. Uh, the same goes for Restream Studio. As mentioned, Restream has uh, a very similar product to uh, StreamYard and you know, video playback, titles, graphics, um, 
backgrounds, pictures and pictures, multi-views, screen sharing, all built in. And I don't need to have a beefy computer at my end to do it. I, they're all kind of limited in the design. You're not really going to get a, the same customization as you can with a dedicated app. But in terms of getting up to speed quickly, you know, paying 20 bucks for StreamYard or whatever, gets you in the door, produce a show, send it where you want to, or record it, and you're done. And you didn't have to have a beefy computer to do it. Um, to step up from those, there are uh, configurable solutions like Dazzle TV, D-A-Z-Z-L dot TV. I interviewed them at NAB. You can see the video on uh, streaming media. Neuralnet, G-N-U-R-A-L net dot com. Uh, even Sony offers cloud production. New Tech's new owner, Vizzert, offers a TriCaster in the cloud called the Viz Vector Plus. So there are lots of solutions out there ready-made for you to just like pay a monthly fee and use their tool. And then if you don't need it for two months, you don't have to pay for it. Lastly, don't rule out putting the tool that you know in the cloud. A lot of people are putting vMix or Wirecast on a server in the cloud, as we had kind of talked a little bit about before. Um, don't want to keep saying Amazon, but Amazon is one is sort of like the the gorilla in the room. You know, Amazon AWS. You can put a server, you know, vMix there. It takes time to configure. It takes time to work out all the nuances and build the drivers and set it up to how you need it, and then getting it to communicate with other pieces. You know, those are things to work out, and then getting it so that you can control it. So if you need to be able to have a control surface, like uh, a stream deck or whatever, and you want to have your buttons control a computer that's not here, there's digital glue, which we'll get to, and that will help make those things come together. Uh, do, 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 do. Automated Simulive stream is offered by On24 for 15 years, but you can schedule through Restream IO too. Yes. Um, Yes, New Tech TriCaster was mentioned. Visit New Tech Restream. Yes, do, do, do. stream art video here. Oh, thanks, Steve. Um, continuing on, just do a quick look over there. And once you figure out the big stuff, you, you can get into streamlining your production to make it easier, more fluid. You know, if you got like a regular production or regular clients, which are great, you know, then you can like build your show, tweak it, automate parts of it. Uh, put five things on a button, you know, that cascade so that you don't have to keep mousing around and clicking everything on the fly. And then that uh, enables you to start using control surfaces because you've sort of automated the process and you're trying to make it more mistake proof. Oh, I clicked the wrong thing. No, I clicked this one thing and it happens. And then once you start looking at control surfaces, like a TriCaster, they've always had dedicated control surfaces, uh, but there's control surfaces available for all these things. Um, I'll just throw out some names. You know, there's X Keys, there's Scarhoy, Elgato Stream Deck, like I just held up. Uh, those are the ones I have. Uh, there's MIDI controllers uh, from Akai, Behringer, Mackie, and a whole bunch of others. You can even uh, repurpose uh, video game controllers that have the USB. There's software out there that will recognize the device you have, and you can assign functions to the buttons and movements and patterns. And if those devices have feedback, like a lot of those things have color, they light up or they light up in different colors, you can then assign feedback to those things so that when this, when this input is in program, then this button's gonna light up red to let me know that this thing is in program and that one's in preview. And that, those are great too. Some of that digital glue is called central control. Um, is a software that you can run. I mean, I know Elgato has their software, which is uh, great for connecting me to vMix or to certain things, but that is sort of like uh, digital glue between me and one thing. These other things are just completely open. If I wanted to have my one device and a button by button, I wanna have this button control my computer and another computer at the same time, or I wanna have this switch something here and then switch something there and then go online in the cloud and do something there, you can put all of that using these um, third-party tools. So I was saying central control. Um, there's another one called BitFocus Companion. There's also Touch OSC, which if you don't want a physical piece of hardware, uh, Touch OSC uses a touch screen like on an iPad and it uses software and then you can physically 
program it with the buttons and knobs and sliders that you want on a device, as opposed to picking up something that says, look, this is 15 buttons. And that's all this is, is 15 buttons. You can say, well, it would be nice if I had four sliders for audio, and then I can have, um, you know, three buttons over here and then two switches, you know, or something like that. And you can customize it to how you want it. And uh, do, 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 even Elgato Stream Deck has a virtual version of their Stream Deck software. So it's like, if you have a Stream Deck, but you need like just two more buttons, you can use the Stream Deck software and put those buttons on your cell phone. So it's like, you've got this thing sitting right next to it and you get you know, a bunch more buttons over here without having to buy an extra Stream Deck. So that's a, a really great tool. And 52, so ah, I did it in under an hour. <laughs> uh, Showflow Studio, yes, thank you for that. I meant to put that in the script. I, we just looked at that ourselves. Showflow Studio uh, looks like it's going to be awesome. Um, it's a little bit on the pricier side. It's not Stream Deck pricing, which is like $20 a month. Showflow is more, we looked at it and I think they were quoting us $1,500 a year, uh, which I mean, monthly is, you know, comes down. And obviously, I think there's going to be tiers up from that, depending upon what options you want. Um, but Showflow is talking about 25 people in the, in the room, not all 25 on stage. I think it's 10 people on stage and 25 in the room, which if you've got uh, and two producers and only two sets of slides, um, only can only record the program right now, but you know, I talked to them. I says, listen, I'd love to have ISO records. Here's a remote production chip as well, not written down. Um, if you're looking to do remote records and uh, there's Camflare is one of them that's been in the message boards. Um, they can have the remote person record. And then there's also a recording thing called Riverside.fm and they kind of look like StreamYard and Restream Studio uh, in that you got the multiple camera pictures and everything. Uh, it's limited to eight if you're in there, seven. But you can get an ISO record from each person and it's an ISO record in the cloud. So as the signal, oh no, I'm sorry. It's not an ISO record in the cloud, which is what Restream and everything is. It's an ISO record on the sender's computer. And that way, internet glitches don't matter. You're actually recording what their computer sees and hears. And then they say, while you're actually doing the show, it's going to start to upload. But, you know, give it time. It's going to probably have to take a little bit of time after they're done. You get the actual file from their computer delivered to your account at riverside.fm. Again, not paid me. Um, I just found out about them. And... Uh, wanted to relay that information, have not had a chance to try out their service, so I can't uh, speak to the quality of what the product is uh, or, or how the whole system works, but I just saw that thing and we've been talking about potentially using it for some of our productions. And um, I really wanted to uh, hope that uh, answers most questions that I've uh, come across that I've seen so far. Uh, it says I got like five minutes left. Let me see if I go through here, if I got any. Internet remote locations. Put this in Q and A too. I am busy. Um, wireless earbuds are frequent options. Lots of AirPods on TV. Yes, I just if you you know big wonky white things sticking out of people's ears. I I tend to not really like that. If I can if you can find a black version or you know gray. Uh, Samsung has ones that are like light gray and. Uh, champagne colored now. Uh, do you recommend an IFB earpiece instead? Uh, no, only because that's a very specialized piece of gear. Um, you know, $15 earbuds from online resellers and, or don't have to be that, that um, expensive because they just need to hear uh, what's being said to them. I thought I heard somebody in my head, but I don't, didn't really hear them very loudly. So uh, do, 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 I'm going to scroll back down. How do you get a higher resolution? How can you get a higher resolution in Zoom? Supposedly there's a 1080 tier that you could pay for that will get it to 1080. But again, it's, it's very dependent upon um, the 
uh, bandwidth because I've had it, I've, I've had events in Zoom where we paid for that and the client was seeing a degraded quality, but that's just because Zoom was just being hit with so much demand that they had to degrade everybody in order to be able to process all the different people using their service at the same time. It's, it's a growth issue. SRT versus WebRTC. I kind of touched on that. Two different protocols serving two different needs. Uh, WebRTC is about uh, speed and immediacy. SRT is about quality. And you get more quality with uh, more delay. Our Zoom 10 is set to 1080p, but we have an enterprise deployment. Yes, you know, so again, leveling up gets you higher quality, you know, always at a bit more cost. But if you need that quality, in, in many cases, it can be available if you need it. Um, I hope this has been uh, helpful. Uh, I suppose I have like three minutes left for any questions. But again, my name is Anthony Barocas. Uh, I have... Um, stream for us and uh, more than a decade long with uh, streaming media guys like Eric here. <laughs> like me. Man, yeah. that was terrific. And and your power held out through the whole thing. And I believe you said earlier on, you're going to be turning this into an article. Is that correct? Uh, well, I, I wrote it out as, as, a, as a script and, you know, it's just like, well, you know what? I'll just hand it off and then we'll put that with the video. Excellent. I'm all for it. <laughs> that was Steve, uh, Anthony's editor in the background there saying he's all for it. And uh, I know, um, you know, someone asked us uh, about halfway through the presentation, can you put links to all these products you're mentioning in the in the chat? And I said, we would need a dedicated staff person doing nothing but putting links in the chat. But I imagine that if you do submit um, a, an article to go along yeah. with the video, that the links will all be there. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's it's much easier in post, and especially in a chat that scrolls by and then it's not archived. It's it, you know, it kind of goes away. Um, if you want, if you want links, they'll be in the article that eventually will appear. Outstanding. Thanks so much, Anthony. And once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Limelight Networks, for sponsoring all of Streaming Media Connect this week, and also to Matrox and EEG Enterprises for sponsoring this particular session. We will be back in a little more than a half hour with our last session of the day, in which Jan Ozer and Abdul Raymond from SimWave will be looking at per title encoding. So I hope to see you then. <laughs>